So I think Bermuda Bermuda will probably be the last holdout. Oh, the, oh yes. Well, that's absolutely British as it stands now. Well, yeah, going yeah. Well, well uh, Maliki, we, we we've had psychiatrists on. We've had different types of people. Now, with the election six weeks away, you figured out we need a hypnotist to get us through till November. And your guest yes. is lined up. Uh, we do. We have a, a a marvelous woman who is being uh, in. I, as a profession, uh, it's an ism, hypnotism, and it's a fascinating profession. And uh, I am, am immensely curious. And our next guest is going to tell us about it. Uh, Melissa Tearson, are you there, dear Melissa? I am here. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you, love. It's grand to be alive <laughs> and uh, and uh, delighted that we finally uh, got together on on the air. Um, so you have been uh, a hypnotist. It's so it sounds so light, but it's far deeper than merely. Oh, you know, a lot of a lot of people over the years have done it as a stage act. And so on. But yes. your, your profession is more profound because yours is to help people uh, with uh, troubles, both physical and mental. So sure. you can a person no, tell us about yourself, first of all, okay. over the okay. years. So, yeah. so I've been a clinical hypnotist for, I don't know, over 20 years. And... I train uh, therapists, doctors um, in, in how to use clinical hypnosis to, to basically break habituated patterns, patterns of thought, patterns of feeling, patterns of thinking. We use clinical hypnosis for pain management, stress management, and every other kind of management Bad you can habits, think of. smoking <laughs> and all that. Yeah, yeah. So now, you know, the, the profession has changed um, drastically, you know, over the years with more and more research and the ability to peer into the brain in action, you know, with fMRIs and PET scans. And so we can see um, what, you know, what effects we have in the brain when people are in hypnotic states and, and depending on the suggestions given, um, what we can do. So, you know, my form of hypnosis these days is, is more like practical neuroscience, you know. So I train yeah. my clients as well as um, therapists to, to kind of utilize what we know about how the brain changes and spur it on. So that's one aspect of what I do, which is my, my training. Um, the other is my private practice where, you know, uh, these days in this crazy political climate, um, yeah. anxiety <laughs> is, on the, is on the spike. <laughs> so, um, Melissa, so, <laughs> uh, uh, so that when people uh, get this in, you are in – in, in uh, still in practice now. How would yeah. people get a hold of you to help them overcome some of their problems? Well, um, they can go to my. I've got a couple of websites. MelissaTears dot com is easy to remember. Um, yes. You know, I have uh, the Center for Integrative Hypnosis. I've got a center here in Chelsea um, that I'm still hanging on to, even though it's. Pretty much uh, <laughs> vacant yeah, for the past Difficult four or five these months. days, yeah. Um, Can so, you still uh, treat people today, uh, Melissa? Absolutely. You know, one of the oh, things good. that uh, that you know that I'm very fortunate to have is is portable skills. You know. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. It's you. You know, Zoom as well as the fact that you know I'm not really I'm not a therapist. So yeah. I'm I'm basically a teacher, really. I teach people how to access these interesting states yeah. of consciousness. I teach people how to use various um, hypnotic uh, pattern interrupts and techniques to 
to kind of change their their state. So that can be done quite easily over Zoom, even over the phone. Can you uh, one of the oft asked questions and curiosities? Can you hypnotize a person without their consent? So, so we get into that weird kind of fuzzy area. Yeah. Um, as far as <clears throat> clinical hypnosis goes, um, pretty much, you know, you, you want someone to be playing along, to be following your suggestions, to be, yeah. you know, to give consent. So, you know, professionally, I would say, no, I don't hypnotize anybody who doesn't give me their consent. Now we can, you know, broaden our definition of what hypnosis is and isn't. And then we can say, well, we've been being hypnotized um, our entire lives without our frickin' consent. Look yeah. at advertising executives. Look at neuromarketing. Look at politics. Look at the repetition. Look at the, you know, the understanding of unconscious biases and heuristics. Oh, my and God, yes. Oh, that's, that all that's, of these people yeah. prey upon. And then you realize, you know, it's all we have to do is... Um, broaden our perspective of what is and isn't influence. And then you start to realize just how manipulated we are on a daily basis, not just externally, right, being primed, psychologically primed by our environment, everything from the color on the walls to the temperature in the room, um, embodied cognition tells us is influencing our decision-making processes and our minds. Um, to, you know, to the internal uh, biases, um, prejudice, manipulations that we have in our, our cognitive filtering systems and our neuro association. So, you know, that's a, it's a big question you've asked. Yeah. I would say well, in our society, professionally, uh, Melissa, no one can hypnotize uh, we, you. <clears throat> in our society, uh, children are largely influenced by uh, television. And the average child, I think I read somewhere, uh, by the time they're 10, they have seen over 50,000 commercials. And yep. they are uh, they are done brilliantly with, uh, and as you use the word, which I think is the operative word in hypnosis, is suggestion. And that, yeah. I never thought of it as so powerful until you just met. I never, it didn't occur to me. Suggest, you know, oh, I suggest that you uh, have a cup of coffee, you know. But, but it's more than that, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's way more than that. So, you know, <clears throat> hypnosis really, if you were looking to define it, is a state of heightened suggestibility. Ah, That's all it is. Yeah. So there's, you know a million ways to get people into that state of heightened suggestibility. But if you've ever watched a movie where, you know, maybe it was a scary movie and you you felt your, you know, that adrenaline rush. Yeah. Then you know that you are in a state of heightened suggestibility, meaning your unconscious processing, which delivers the, you know, adrenaline hit and extra blood and oxygen to the arms and the legs. You can fight or flight. That has been stimulated, right, because yes, of this that's right, yeah. idea, this movie, what was this the scene other you're name watching. for hypnosis? Uh, I'm trying to think of this clinical, it was out named after the doctor. Uh, well, which one? Mesmerism? Mesmerism, yes. Mesmer, wasn't it? <laughs> Dr. Mesmer? Yes. I couldn't Mark. think of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> so so the, 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 the funny thing about that is he had, you know, his whole shtick was that it was some type of animal magnetism, right? And that oh. his, he was having this magnetic uh, influence and, and, and he was curing, you know, loads and loads of, of psychosomatic illnesses. Blind people were seeing and all of this. He believed it was his magnetic influence that he could, you know, uh, manipulate. And then Ben Franklin and a bunch of other people went to investigate, right? They were like, what is this? And what they found was that it wasn't uh, some type of, 
you know, uh, m- m- magnetic Power. influence. Yeah. It was suggestibility and imagination that was delivering the cures. So right then we should have like started to change our focus of, you know, of research to say, wow, what is it about, you know, suggestion and imagination that made, you know, that person be able to undergo a horrible operation with no pain? Or what is it that made that, you know, uh, his, you know, the, the, the blind person see, uh, but you know, anyway, I could go off on, why oh, placebo is well, not listen, more you're, widely researched. You are qualified. But... <laughs> I'm talking to Melissa Tearson, and she is a clinical hypnotist. And uh, could we get again where people can uh, get a hold of you uh, of course, for so... whatever their conditions are? Right. So Melissa Tears, T I E R S dot com. I have um, books. Uh, available oh, yes. out there on Amazon. I've got uh, integrative hypnosis. Most of them are for practitioners. So, you know, if you want to do this work, if you're a coach, if you're a therapist, my, you know, um, that's who the books are for, except for a very small anti-anxiety toolkit book. But I do have um, online programs available at centerforintegrativehypnosis.com. And, and I've been teaching certification trainings over Zoom, and I have, uh, you know, one coming up in October, October 3rd, um, you know, for people that want to learn how to do this work, which is really, I mean, I, I left rock and roll for this, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of fascinating and, and definitely, intri- you know, keeps, keeps me interested. My, I have a colleague here, uh, Melissa, John McDonough, and I know he's a great broadcaster, and I know he has questions. Are you there, John? Well, <laughs> Malachi, I don't know if we should uh, avail our services now or after November 3rd, because I'll never forget uh, when we were, never thought that uh, George W. Bush would win a second term, was hanging out Rocky Sullivan's. The aftermath of uh, of that election sprawled out on the barroom floor watching the results <sighs> coming in. I think her services are going to be uh, hopefully not needed after n- November 3rd. But the, the oh, one God. question I have is what, what, what is it like? <laughs> Uh, can you say the difference between you doing your person to person hypnosis as opposed to going to Zoom? I mean, is there a big difference or you still need that real person to person watch their, you know, their face, how they look or just get their body impression as you're talking to them? Because Zoom is very you feel like you're not close to that person. You just see them pixelated up on the screen. I mean, I know you have to go like the rest of us to do things on Zoom, but uh, I mean, you, you would prefer person to person. And what is the difference between the two? Well, you know, it's funny. I was very late uh, to to the to the virtual session game. I was always, you know, um, more uh, into the in person. I thought I couldn't read all of the nonverbal communication and the body language, just as you mentioned, um, unless I was really there. Now, I've been I'm, I'm happy to say I was proven wrong just by, you know, the use of a good microphone and they have good headphones. And then I'm beaming right directly into their ears. You know, it's a little, it's actually more intense. What I do, uh, you know, the trade-off is I can't see anything from, you know, the the waist up. And I do study um, nonverbal communication. So I'm used to seeing you know, the whole body and being able to, um, to take that in. But um, I have found that, you know, I mean, except for when I'm working with uh, younger kids, um, Zoom seems to be comparable. My, my, my last book was on working uh, with uh, kids and teens. And so I do get What's a What's the name of that, uh, Melissa? Where can people get it? Um, that's uh, you, you can you can find it on uh, Amazon, and it was written with one of my brilliant colleagues um, who works with uh, young children, and it's integrative hypnosis for kids and teens, playing for change. Uh-huh. And, okay, integrated. And so that's where I feel for... a little compromised in that you know I'm I'm good at getting kids' attention and playing. Yeah. We can get up. I've got. 
you know, things in my office that will draw their attention that I can use as therapeutic metaphors. And, and all of a sudden, if I'm on Zoom, I can't really, I've got to be really on my game in order to hold the attention of an anxious seven-year-old. <laughs> you know? So there's the challenge for me. Uh, well, it's well, uh, now you you uh, uh, you are a clinical hypnotist, and so therefore you've had to <clears throat> study brain functions and bodily functions. And uh, where have you done that? Where have you gotten your well, education in that? Right. So I, I should say, you know, it, I wish that every uh, <laughs> therapist. A uh, clinician of all kinds would study brain function, but unfortunately, that is not the case. Um, I have simply because I'm fascinated. I wanted to know what was happening. You know, yeah. I I always say that I'm 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 in this field um, because I'm curious. I want to know how change happens. I want to understand the malleability of mind, um, and 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 what's going on under the hood. So. I really studied, I mean, uh, other than taking workshops with, you know, uh, n neuroscientists and webinars and reading, you know, I didn't uh, study neuroscience in college. I, you know, I was an English major, so <laughs> way back when, uh, in, an in another age. But yeah. what I did do was study on my own, and yeah. I, I find the best teachers and I travel to them and I study with them and I there's never a moment where I'm not either reading or listening or watching something to do with the mind now that branches out right so I, I study embodied cognition I study unconscious priming I study um, oh all God. of those things <laughs> uh, because it because it, it all comes into play I understand you know, repetition, right? We all kind of understand that, you know, that neurons that fire together, wire together thing. And so yeah. I, I understand when I, when I um, give clients all homework and they, through repetition, build stronger, you know, uh, synaptic connections. What I didn't understand was what was happening in my sessions where I would see someone with a phobia and I would spend one session with them, and then they would be free of the phobia. That didn't make sense to me um, as far as what I understood uh, brain change to be. So I looked a little deeper. And then we get into the interesting things of like um, memory reconsolidation and therapeutic memory reconsolidation and the mechanism underneath what turns on and, and, and turns off that kind of uh, synaptic unlocking of, of memory and the emotional aspect of memory. And that's what we can change when we change certain things like, you know, phobic responses or, you know, fear of public speaking or these things. We can actually go in and rapidly, more rapidly yeah. than anyone ever supposed up until five years ago, um, we can change the emotional track of a memory, not the yeah. cognitive piece, not the episodic piece, the semantic piece, but the, the affect. And that is, you know, so, so to me, I get excited about learning more about how we can take something that's going on maybe in, in a laboratory of a neuroscientist and how can we bring that into the therapeutic uh, relationship? And what, well, um, uh, the other a couple of couple of things, uh, if you could, before we end, could you? We have thousands of people listening now, and they are extremely uneasy about what's happening with the uh, the disease and the political situation and the crisis the country is uh, going through. So, <sighs> yep. can you? inculcate a message of hope today before we before we go uh, that's one thing the other is can you that's, influence that's a, tall ask. a person 
<laughs> I want you to hypnotize the I'm nation, not a Melissa. Worker. <laughs> I give, I've just said it's a, a nation of hope, and I want you to under, underpin that and rise <laughs> us all up. I wish I was as, and then as we all be done. We'll you. make you president. <laughs> <laughs> I what, wish I um, had your optimism. The other question I have is, a, pet, a person with uh, limited mental faculties, I have a stepdaughter who is uh, what they call, the other times, retarded severely. She doesn't speak or so forth. Could Can you have any influence on a person with limited uh, facilities? You know, it's it's a good question. I've, I've helped a few um Kids on the Spectrum, my, my colleague Kelly Woods, who, who wrote the book with me uh, for Kids and Teens, she has a lot more experience working with people towards that end of the spectrum. Um, yes. You know, I would say uh, there's a lot we can do to influence, to create, to, to understand the unconscious priming of environments, yeah. of um, shifting your own tone of voice, of going into a state where you become more apt to influence um, on an unconscious level. One of the things I always try to bring to people's attention is that we are never not communicating with each other. Um, yeah. You know, and that we have uh, one of the things I've been fascinated with bringing into my sessions is polyvagal theory. And this is what I would direct you to investigate um, because there's something called neuroception. And Stephen Porges, who wrote, literally wrote the book on polyvagal theory, um, yeah. he talks about neuroception, meaning the perception of the nervous system. And it's an evolutionary thing. And so there's certain things that will trigger safety or not safety that most, that 99% of the population is not aware of. Funny enough, Hollywood uh, seems to be aware of it because all of their villains, yeah. you know, um, trigger our, 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 you know, our upregulation of the vagus nerve. Uh, so this is a long-winded answer, and I apologize, but it's it's just not no, a simple no, no, answer. No, no, so, no, it's a, I'm so, so when you when you answer. understand how um, we are influencing, uh, and you understand that we have social brains, and these brains are always seeking to um, influence and be influenced by whoever we are with, that there's certain facial expressions and tonality shifts, you know, prosody and all of these things that will um, calm people who can't uh, understand the uh, cognitive suggestions. So there's ways... So what uh, if uh, one of the things I just... (coughs) uh, One of the uh, tools that... uh, dictators and aspiring dictators use uh, to Mm -hmm. gain followers like they got the millions of sensible, decent people like it. uh, I mean, all those Germans were not all Nazis, but somehow or another, this guy uh, got them. I I don't know if he hypnotized them or what he did, but also this is what's happening. No matter what this guy in the White House does, he, uh, uh, down to shooting some people. Oh, yeah, that's okay, so long as it's not me. Well, is here, there any so way here, uh, we can have to look uh, into assure people the... <laughs> that uh, you don't have to be afraid? The fear is the thing they inculcate. They're now trying to frighten the people in Cuba, uh, in uh, Cubans, refugees in Florida. They're saying that that Biden or somebody else is going to bring back all the ter- terrible things that Castro did to them when they were in, in, uh, in Cuba. How can we assuage, take away that fear in, some, in ourselves as well? Right. Well, <laughs> I know it's a huge <laughs> how, question. How long do we have? All right. So yeah. here's some, some little ideas, some little insights. And, and, and you might want to look into the work of George Lakoff when you want to look at the conservative versus the, the liberal brain. And you'll George see we, who? We, Lakoff? Uh, George Lakoff. Yeah. A cognitive L-A-K-E? linguistic. L-A-K-O-F-F? L-A-K-O-F-F. Yes. And okay. he's done a lot of interesting work on understanding the difference between the conservative versus the liberal brain. But the thing you have to understand is not only is the, the, the Republicans' use 
of anger and fear so amazingly yeah. strategic. Um, but the Democrats don't quite understand that in this climate, you know, they've, they've got to hook into an emotional state because it is not cognitive. It's not logical. People don't vote with their prefrontal cortex. They vote with their limbic system. And the Republicans Whoa. know how to stimulate that. They know how to get in there, give you a threat, and then say, we're the answer. You know, we're going we're gonna to yeah. get you angry and afraid, and then we're going to tell you that they are to blame and we are the solution. And they're good at that. And, and you know, I know that a lot of flack has been, you know, a lot of progressives and, and Democrats, and, you know, I am definitely a progressive. Um, they don't like the Lincoln Project. And I see the Lincoln Project as, as, as a, a big step in helping Democrats to understand the strategy of, you know, anger and fear and how, the, how the, do the, the, the Lincoln Project is a like, group of, of thinking Republicans who have decided that they're yeah, not going to follow uh, Trump. That's right. Now, you know, when I post, when I repost their ads saying, see, this is what this is what we need. The Democrats need to look at this and see how yeah. strategic it is, how brilliant it is. In, in my opinion, how they, you know, how the Democrats haven't already put, you know, Mitch McConnell saying over and over again that he wouldn't even give a hearing to Garland. Right. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. And how that's not already an ad, you know, because they're going to try and get someone in there. I'm sorry. You wanted hope. Yes, so let yeah. me reel, reel in my anger <laughs> and, and, and say that <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, one of the things Barack Obama did was he, even though he had a tendency to go way too cerebral for uh, the political brain, he too forgiving and too to, human. <laughs> yeah, he knew how to inspire that hope. Right. Because yeah. you talked about hope and that yeah. was the thing. And if you listen to the rhythm of his speeches, sometimes if you the yeah. cadence, you know, the the almost lulling you into this state and then spiking it with some hope, you know, and that is something that unfortunately, um, you know, Biden is not very good at, you know, now yeah. Bernie could utilize anger, you know, he that was his thing and 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 to to a certain extent it was great and it 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 would have worked but didn't know how to temper it with hitting the right positive emotional tone he just started to sound like the guy saying get off my lawn you know to a lot of people <laughs> that weren't already in his camp i'm i i love bernie sanders i always have you yes. know um but it's the same thing. Elizabeth Warren didn't understand how to get into the limbic yeah. system. They're just they're thinking that we still live in a world that values facts and logic and, and decency and humanitarianism. And decency. <laughs> exactly. So what you know, hopefully, sorry, I realize it's your birthday. Let's let me figure out how to. <laughs> well, listen. This, uh, well, listen. Positive. This is not going to be the last time that you're going to be on here because you have uh, what you have done uh, is you have raised our hopes that, that something can be done about our well, hopelessness. Well, yes, I, I think I think many things can be done, and I I think you know um, even in the worst case scenario scenario uh sometimes you know people got to hit rock bottom and i think as a nation we we have been we have been trolling the bottom for a while and you know and 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 something something's got to give and maybe maybe this is well, the, the rock bo bottom a bottom, a bottom a bottom is a foundation that's where you are and so there's no uh <laughs> No, no, uh, there is, there is, one if we do hit bottom, then we, we start climbing again, and there it but be. That, and that's it, and that's it, and the truth is we have a nation that has been built on many flawed 
yeah. premises. And, 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 you know, as much as we can, you know, look at Trump and say, oh, my God, what go, have you go, done? Go. You know, it's, it's, really, it's really far more than, than Trump. Trump is just the, you know, the, the blister on the top of something that has been festering since the founding of this country. And so I think that maybe what, what hope can happen is that we go so low that there's nowhere else to go but up, that maybe we, we do tear down some of the been living uh, with in, no. in almost a complacent <laughs> yeah. way for all these years. Maybe now well, is the time. And, and, well, and in, in recovery, people do say, it was when it got so bad it couldn't get any worse. I didn't just hit rock bottom. My, you know, my my nose was was in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maliki, we we're going to have to wrap uh, up here. Finish, uh, Melissa. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, Maliki. Uh, yeah. We will. So it, we will talk again. And thank you for that most <laughs> and happy form. birthday. I don't know where the half hour yeah, went. And 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 Melissa, I've just been informed yes. by my wife that I know your sister Lori who works with hey. her in family court in Brooklyn. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> My legal aid lawyer, Sister Yes, Marie. yes. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, Maliki, uh, we're going to finish up now about uh, what she was talking about, about what happened with Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her replacement, which is going to be rushed through. 